Thank you. It's always such a pleasure to be here. Um, and I love the fact that when I come in the doors, uh, the grandmother greets me as I come in. So I don't know what, probably all of you have similar experiences, but my, my grandmothers were very important to me. So when, when Kaya greets you when you come into this building, uh, it seems to me that's a really powerful way to say hello to everyone and make you feel welcome. And at the same time, since she's standing on that little guy, uh, you realize that grandmothers are also the ones who set the rules and the ones who maintain the, the perimeters of, uh, of culture and order for all of us. So, uh, so walking past Kaya on the way in here always is, a, is an important part of the experience for me. And, uh, and it and it's always has been. I don't know how many times I've come up here, but every time I come up here, I come away with something that was more than worth the trip. I hope we can uh, do something close to that uh, for you tonight. Um, because because my, my aims are really relatively modest. Uh, there are a number of individuals who contributed enormously uh, to our ability to think about and talk about and understand the culture of this place. Tulalip is enormously important to all of us. The people of Tulalip, the culture of Tulalip, its role in history, its role in prehistory are all a really key part of the story of this place, which is of very great importance, I think, to some of us. And, uh, and the gentlemen that I wanted to focus on tonight, basically just three of many that, uh, through their life's work, contributed things that I think are really important. We just finished um, uh, a book reading at the library in Everett, uh, where we were uh, basically uh, working our way through yet another examination of the work of Edward Curtis. And Mr. Curtis and his project are probably pretty well known to all of you. But I think one of the things that tends to get lost is the fact that genre photography, that sounds like a pejorative term, but the fact is that in the Pacific Northwest and elsewhere throughout America, uh, photography of the American Indian is something that was the stock and trade of, of uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of, of photographers and that some of them did it better than others. And I always felt that we were especially blessed here to have people like the three individuals that I wanted to talk a little bit about. Uh, I, I have a sheet up there that's got these, these people's names and the dates of their lives uh, up front. And if you didn't get one on the way in, uh, uh, you might want to have one on the way out. Because Norman Edson and, uh, and Ferd Brady and, and J.A. Juleen, each of them made enormous contributions to our ability to visualize what the culture of this place was like and to, and to come close to, uh, 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 to the people uh, that, uh, that practice that culture and, and to the history that that represents. And uh, so, uh, lest anybody get the impression that, uh, let me see here, we got... <coughs> but lest you come to the conclusion that the three people I'm talking about are the only people who are doing this, or were... Uh, not part of a major <coughs> effort by many commercial photographers to record Native Americans. When you go back to the very beginnings of photography in the Pacific Northwest, the first resident photographer in Seattle, for instance, C.M. Samus, who also took the first photographs that we know of of Snohomish County at the end of the American Civil War, took the only image that we have of Chief Seattle, which is what we're, what we're looking at. As he happened to just see Seattle walking by the front of his studio and invited him in and sat him down and got the one image that now has been transmogrified into color and uh, three dimensions and all kinds of different ways. Every which way but loose, the image of Seattle has been, uh, has been modified and changed. And essentially the beginnings of commercial photography then involved the beginning of images of Native Americans. We're lucky at Everett because even photographers who didn't get into it to any great extent, people like, uh, like uh, King and Baskerville, who arrived in Everett in 1892, left wonderful images like, like this one. K uh, King and Baskerville are not famous for their photography of, of Native Americans, but this picture taken at the foot of California on the Snohomish River is a really graceful, beautifully composed piece of work in an unusual format. King and Baskerville were using a... Uh, what they call the boudoir format that's a slightly panoramic uh, five by eight uh, image, uh, half of an eight by 10 plate. Uh, nobody wanted to waste that extra inch, so they left it there. And, uh, and this picture taken in the spring of 1892 is a favorite photograph that shows 
gracefully Native Americans uh, interfacing with an industrial city that was about to erupt at the west end of the Great Northern Railway. Uh, from this vantage point here, you can just barely see the, uh, the warehouse in the upper right-hand corner on a wharf that was built by a man who was half Native American, Neil Spidell. And from this point, the, the tribesmen would go uptown and swap uh, at, for instance, J.J. Clark's department store. Uh, Native American women made wonderful woolen socks that they would uh, exchange for other goods. As a matter of fact, my current partner in the Northwest Room worked, uh, worked with the Field Museum in Chicago, and uh, Marshall Field did a, did a lively trade with merchants like J.J. Clark in which they got baskets and other goods that had been manufactured by Native Americans and then put them on their shelves in uh, stores uh, in Chicago and elsewhere and also accumulated an amazing collection of uh, woven materials that wound up in the Field Museum. But the guy that I wanted to start off with, who was one of the earliest to put a, a real name to the, uh, to the uh, idea of uh, Snohomish County Native American photography, was, uh, was Norman uh, Edson, Norman Sidney Edson, uh, actually a Canadian born up in Quebec, uh, the son of a well-known Canadian landscape painter. His, uh, his father was a, uh, was a respected, uh, well-educated gentleman who did, uh, who did landscapes that are still valued and still turn up in catalogs. Uh, you can Google uh, Alan, uh, Aaron Allen Edson and you'll find examples of his work. And you can see how that impacted uh, his son's ability, although his son died while, um, his, his father died while the son was still just a, just a youngster, that um, Norman Edson picked up a lot of that and picked up a lot of other skills that he needed in school. He was trained as an artist and he was something of a Renaissance man. When he arrived in Snohomish County in uh, about 1905, uh, because his wife's family were located here, uh, he almost immediately found a fellow by the name of Burt Brush. And Brush's studio did all kinds of commercial photography, portrait photography. Uh, Brush was the mentor to a number of different photographers in Everett and Snohomish County, taught them the trade. Sometimes they worked for him. Sometimes he just showed them the ropes and they took off on their own. That was kind of the case with Norman Edson. As Norman Edson wasn't working for Burt Brush for very long before he struck off on his own and began making his own photographs and selling his own photographs. In an unpublished memoir, Edson, Edson probably does a, a, an unusually good job of uh, candidly explaining what the attitude toward Native American photography was. He said that Brush told him that a lot of people love that stuff and you can make a lot of money if you take pictures of Indians. So uh, he began doing that, but I, I, you can't help but feel that uh, by the time he opened his, his studio in the old Clark building at the corner of Wetmore and Hewitt in downtown Everett, that uh, it was more than just a cold desire to make uh, cash that motivated Edson. His photographs uh, show uh, a wonderful sensitivity to, uh, from the standpoint of composition, certainly. And uh, he also fit rather, rather nicely into the social structure of the place and the time. Uh, when you see the way the people are reacting to this particular individual and his, and his lens, um, there's no question that he was welcome up here and the pictures that he took uh, were, uh, reflect a, a, a sense that he felt <coughs> pleased to be, to be in that environment. Uh, here you see him uh, with, uh, in front of a mat hut uh, uh, and the woman has got basketry in progress there and he chose to have his picture, to snap a picture of himself with his two uh, new friends. Um, I, I, he, sh he should have stuck around and done this for a long time, but he was only active in Everett for a couple of years before he went, he went elsewhere. Some accounts say he went back up to Canada. Uh, his own autobiography talks about going back to Chicago and elsewhere, but he, he wasn't here very long as a commercial photographer. And of course, if you look closely at the private life of Norman Edson, it was um, uh, intellectually busy. He was a violinist. Uh, like his father, he was, uh, he was a painter. Uh, he was quite a, a dauntingly uh, knowledgeable ornithologist who took pictures of birds. Uh, 
after he was taking pictures up here at Tulalip, he began to do pictures of, of bird life. And, um, and he also hand colored a lot of his photographs. And by the time he came back to the Northwest, uh, around the First World War, he was, he was busy making um, orotones like, uh, like Curtis had with that special, those nice uh, funky sort of frames and the, uh, and the dark uh, gold tones. Uh, Edson, by that time, had gravitated away from people and more toward the scenic grandeur of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, so his pictures, his hand-colored pictures of Mount Rainier, for instance, are what you'll find. Well, I hit eBay and look for Norman Edson. Uh, he's got examples of his portraits of Mount Rainier are still available at, uh, at nice prices. But the work at Tulalip is just excellent work. Um, what he shows often is like uh, is carefully composed uh, photographs like this one of a couple complete with, with a dog and, and a salmon and a woven mat and a canoe, two canoes really. Uh, a really wonderfully composed uh, photograph, again from the, from the photographs that he made just in the short time that he was active in Everett and Snohomish County for a year or two around 1905, 19, uh, The fate of these photographs of the, uh, of the original negatives is still something of a mystery. Um, during the days when we were working closely with special collections at the University of Washington, uh, Robert Monroe uh, was attempting to acquire Edson's negatives from uh, the estate over on Vashon Island, and he never successfully acquired those. But to this very day, Vashon Island is very, very proud of Norman Edson. You can go over there and you can, uh, you can see the little cottage and studio that he lived in. And, uh, and uh, he, uh, he, he wound up dying there. Sadly, he lived into his 90s, but then it was one of those sad situations where you had a flu scare and you got a flu shot. And uh, essentially, at the age of 91, he died from the results of a, of a, of a, of a flu vaccination. There's a close-up of that same shot. These were all restrikes from the negatives that were in the studio over on Vashon Island as late as the 1960s. And, uh, and we, in, in many cases, have tried to resurrect them from rather hastily made prints, Velox prints that were done um, from the original negatives, but not with particular care and not particular uh, interest in uh, longevity. So we have transferred these and we, uh, Bob Monroe was very, was very generous with the uh, prints that he'd managed to get to show around to convince people at the university that Edson's material needed all to be transferred into special collections. That never happened. So the eventual fate of Edson's negatives, of the Tulalip photographs, the originals, uh, is, is, uh, is kind of unknown. This wonderful photograph with smoking racks. Uh, he, did, he did wonderfully complex things with uh, diagonals and uh, trapezoids. And here you see a woven hut uh, with, the, uh, with the racks where salmon's being smoked. And again, you've got the ubiquitous canine and the family clustered near where their food is, is uh, being prepared. And a favorite, William Wealock was a well-known individual on on the res. As a matter of fact, he was one of the first to receive a tribal allotment. I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, he was in the first dozen or so that actually were listed uh, to, be, uh, uh, to be given an allotment of land. And um, he wound up uh, uh, posing <laughs> for, for this wonderful picture that uh, why, why he turned out in such sartorial splendor for uh, an afternoon on the beach where you've got He's smoking salmon rows and, and salmon on racks, but he looks like he's on his way to the opera. And, uh, uh, and yet, the, a wonderful, a wonderful uh, individual who looks like exactly what he was, a mentor, uh, an individual who uh, was loved and respected by the community he was a part of. And, and he was, as a matter of fact, he was a mentor to William Shelton, uh, long before Shelton began trying to single-handedly resurrect uh, the culture that was being lost uh, he, was, he was part of the time living with William Wealop, and Wealop was one of the people who kind of kept an eye on him during a couple of his uh, spirit quest activities that he engaged in. Uh, but uh, a memorable Edson photograph in which he's obviously engaged his subject so beautifully that it uh, uh, 
a favorite, I mean, a favorite photograph. How can you not, not love that photograph? And Edson that got transformed into drawings, and uh, he loved to do ink drawings from photographs that he'd taken, uh, people or birds for that matter, or landscapes. And um, this picture of, uh, of William Shelton's mother uh, is an especially beautiful example. He played with the composition a, a little bit when he was doing drawings or paintings from this. And it got sold for postcards, and a lot of the Edson stuff wound up being uh, transmogrified into postcards, and some of them colored, hand colored. Uh, uh, Mrs. Shelton, uh, this is a, it's an amazing uh, photograph considering that it's a restrike, a Velox restrike that was rather hastily done uh, to get the image off a glass negative, but uh, but it had been uh, it had it had been widely distributed as one of a series of postcards. Um, another wonderful, this is, this is, I, this, this is probably um, the only real close close up that, that Edson did, but again kind of exhibits his versatility in groups or working right in the lady's lap practically. Uh, this is Napoleon, a Snoqualmie, uh, photographed on the res about 1905. The story is that he was trying, he told in his, in his unpublished memoir that, that uh, uh, Priest Point Sam and his wife were involved in his efforts to try and get some clam digging shots. He wanted to do a gold tone of some sort. It's a very long, complex, shaggy dog story in which Mrs. Sam was not interested in doing it. And uh, he eventually wound up coaxing her, taking this picture of the couple and then eventually convincing her that uh, that she should pose uh, out on the mudflats uh, so that he could do a gold tone of her uh, pursuing clams. But this is not only interesting from the, from the standpoint of the, the people that he's captured rather adroitly here, but, but also the architecture, because what you see is probably the last phase of the development of the split cedar uh, buildings that were traditionally constructed uh, by the, by the Lachutzine speaking peoples, where you see a large proportion of split cedar and then uh, in this particular case it's beginning to take on a bungalow-like configuration which is not exactly what it would have been originally but it still has a lot of that texture and a lot of that flavor of a house that's made from pieces of cedar split off in many cases perhaps from a tree still standing upright. The, the, the next person that I wanted to talk about is a fellow, his name alone is enough to capture your imagination, is Ferdinand Brady was actually born down in Benton County, Oregon, and came up here uh, and uh, wound up in, in Marysville, where he fell in with a, with a commercial photographer who eventually wanted to get out of the business. Um, and uh, Walter, Walter Wood is not really anybody, I don't know that we've ever even seen any of his photographs, but when Walter decided to get out of the business, uh, he sold his outfit to, uh, to Ferd, and Ferd, Ferdinand Brady began uh, uh, com his career in commercial photography. He's supposed to have actually been employed by, by the government to take pictures of buildings on, on the reservation. And one of the remarkable things about what he's left are, are a number of pictures of structures that were important. Uh, for instance, the, the office of the, of, the, uh, uh, of the superintendent, uh, this beautiful salt box that, uh, that stood until the First World War, most of this photograph and a lot of the postcards that Brady did were, were done around 1912 or so. But this is, the, this is the Millwright's house that was part of the 1853 settlement at Tulalip that was really the first homesteading, the first uh, Tulalip, the first settlement in, what's, in what became Snohomish County. Uh, a settlement that really began uh, toward the end of or Oregon Territory in October of 1852, just as Oregon Territory was about to be transformed, this our part of it, into Washington Territory. Uh, but this was part of that, of that key early settlement, not too far from where their water-powered sawmill was located. And Brady was very busy taking pictures of the, of the old sawmill. Uh, originally, the 1853 settlement had had a sawmill that was driven by an overshot water wheel. But um, early in the 20th century, they replaced that with a turbine-type uh, wheel. Interestingly enough, William Shelton seems to have known how to operate both of those apparatus. And, uh, 
And Brady was busy taking pictures inside and out of the structures on, on the res. I wish I could tell you that, that we have these, but, but the fact is that most of the Brady's uh, that uh, relate to Tulalip are in the collection of the Museum of History and Industry. You can get a good look at those on the University of Washington's website, uh, but they're not in our collection at the library. We have a handful of things that show Brady's skills at uh, interiors. As a matter of fact, uh, he left around the same time that he was taking a lot of the Tulalip material, some wonderful photographs inside the Lowell paper mill that show the sorts of skills that uh, make his, his early photography memorable. And all, most all of it is, is, in, uh, is in postcard format. Um, pictures of mill workers. Again, admirably strong compositions with uh, a gift for candid photography. One of my favorite industrial shots from the early 20th century is this picture of the calendar machine at the Lowell paper mill that he, that he took. It shows everybody gathered in front of the machines. And uh, Ferd, Ferd was, uh, was an interesting individual who drifted in and out of the photography business. He wound up toward the end of his career up in Anacortes uh, and was, uh, was busy up there for a time. In the meantime, he'd, he'd been in Everett a little bit. He, he worked for, for a while with, um, Ro with R.J. Young, Robert Young, who had been a Muckleteo photographer and then helped to start uh, the home portrait studio in Everett. But um, again, this is just um, first-rate uh, uh, commercial photography. But of course, our collection, the pride of our collection, are the photographs of, uh, of J.A. Juline. Um, Juline, this, this is one of my favorite photographs of Juline, probably very shortly after he arrived in Everett in 1908. <coughs> he didn't actually become a, a, a professional photographer until about 1909 or 1910. His real field was uh, electrical engineering, and when he first arrived in Everett, that's what he was doing. But he uh, almost immediately began to arrange for a move into the field that he really loved, which was, uh, which was photography. And uh, he stayed, had a career of more than two decades, and when he finally, when he died uh, in 1935, uh, uh, he was uh, such a fixture of the Central Business District that I think everybody was kind of stunned to lose him. He was only 61 when he died. And his wife, Lee, of course, carried on the studio so that a lot of his work is around today. But more than any of the photographers that we have represented in the Everett Public Library's collection, Jay Juline is the man who left us with uh, uh, Tulalip material that is, that is priceless. And in most cases, we have the original glass negatives that he shot up here at Tulalip starting in 1912 or 1913 and right through uh, the time of his death uh, in, 19, in 1935. Uh, and of course, the great thing about that is that it coincides very closely with William Shelton's efforts to resurrect uh, the culture of the Tulalip, uh, of the Tulalip uh, people. And from a, an early point, he was very, very close to William Shelton. But again, you'll see something very different than what other photographers are doing. Rather than attempting to exploit a romantic notion. What he's got here is William Shelton, a carver, a storyteller, uh, an individual who, uh, who uh, was uh, struggling to maintain and to, uh, and to propagate uh, public knowledge of a traditional way of life that uh, in a studio, wearing a sweater, uh, not, not uh, uh, decked out in, in feathers or, uh, or any other paraphernalia. Just, this is, this is the man that uh, J. A. Julien came to know as a person who was uh, determined that the way of life of his ancestors was not going to be obliterated altogether if he could do anything about it. Uh, these, the, the portrait work, he did a series of portraits of William Shelton uh, seated in, in the studio. Uh, Frank LaRoche and a few other photographers had done that, but studio photography of Native Americans not in their native dress was not something that was widely done. It wasn't as marketable as, as if you had gotten them in authentic garb. Uh, Shelton's Renaissance, of course, included building a longhouse for, for, his, uh, for his family and his people to gather in. And, uh, and Julien was there in 1913 and 1914 to record that. Uh, this is from a glass negative that's in the collection at the Everett Public Library and shows the, uh, the longhouse that uh, he had to uh, 
get permission to, from the government uh, to build. And on Treaty Day in 1914, he left a memorable series of, of uh, five by seven glass negatives that show us, uh, well, in this case, an individual who's probably going to get yelled at by Superintendent Buchanan for showing up in a dog's wool blanket carrying a stone knife. Um, Buchanan was uh, ambivalent <laughs> about, about uh, Shelton's attempts to, uh, uh, to preserve and practice uh, tribal culture. And as a result of that, uh, somebody who takes the giant leap to come out in public like this. You know, he's got these blue jeans on underneath there. You know, it's not like that. <laughs> but, uh, but this is not the kind of behavior that uh, made Buchanan particularly comfortable. Uh, Buchanan uh, especially was disturbed by the Shaker by the Shaker faith activities, he, did, he allowed it on the res, but he was not, uh, he wasn't happy about it. And, uh, and so Shelton had to uh, negotiate some tricky uh, uh, sorts of barriers in order to get what he needed to have done uh, so that uh, the people could gather in a traditional style gathering place. And of course, what you see going on here is so beautifully captured by Julene and is a, is a direct result. It's like the building we're, we're standing in represents the same kind of sense of family, the same kind of sense of personal relationships that, that, the, res, that the res at its best is all about. Uh, and then, of course, Julene did tour de force things like this uh, without any kind of uh, sophisticated uh, lighting techniques or any sort of um, technical... Uh, 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 things up his sleeve, he, he got this wonderful photograph of them playing the stick game in a smoky interior of the longhouse in January of 1914. Um, this is the full frame of the 5 by 7 negative, a, a wonderful photograph. It catches the flavor of the gathering. Uh, amazing photograph. And of course, details of a lot of the pictures that were taken on that occasion, again, maximize what it was all about. What it was all about was the closeness within families and within groups of families that was palpable in the Longhouse uh, from the time it opened. You could cluster in the vicinity of the Longhouse that had your, uh, your uh, emblem uh, so you knew where you belonged. And of course, some of, these, some of the poles from that first Longhouse have survived. Some of them are still we're all on display just across the, uh, the way from us here inside the new uh, Longhouse room. And uh, he also photographed the Montessori school here at, at Tulela, which is something while, uh, while Ferdinand Brady was photographing government buildings in the places where children were being rather vigorously indoctrinated in a culture that was not their own a gentler sort of thing was happening around the periphery and Julene was photographing what was going on there in the Montessori school. Although this looks a little draconian, but <laughs> they actually frightened her in pain. <laughs> we have a series of glass negatives taken by Julene uh, of the children at the Montessori school. Again in the years just before America's entry into the First World War. And of course, he was there to record the whole process of, um, of carving the poles that, uh, that Shelton um, uh, spent so much time and effort on. This is the Everett story pole. The first pole that, uh, that Shelton carved, um, uh, Ferd Brady did a wonderful job of documenting that in photographs that are in the, in the uh, Museum of History and Industries collection. Uh, you can see uh, the original Sklalitut pole uh, stretched out inside the, the mill building so that, uh, so that Shelton could work on it. And here you see the story pole that he did shortly thereafter for Everett in its original location in the middle of California and Wetmore, right smack in the middle of the street. And of course, uh, many of the stories that, that Shelton himself had told to, uh, to Herman Haberlin and Erna Gunther uh, were carved on this pole, uh, immortalized so that people would always remember that the value system that was expressed in these fables uh, was uh, consistent with, uh, 
value system of parents and elders everywhere. Uh, the bad example tucked under the octopus's arm up there on top, Bus Chub the mink. Bus Chub was the bad guy. Bus Chub was vain and rude and smelly. Uh, further on down, you can see uh, 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 at the very bottom of the pole an interesting, intriguing, uh, maybe a little enigmatic dedication of the pole to the memory of Chief Pat Kanan, the last of the charismatic tribal leaders, the Snoqualmie uh, leader who actually signed the 1855 treaty, uh, and, uh, but as many people felt was uh, uh, not entirely committed uh, to, the, uh, to the program that the, that the uh, invading culture uh, had laid out for him. Uh, he died in the 1850s and Shelton chose Pat Keenum as the figure to whom he would dedicate this memorial to the values, to the stories of, uh, of his tribe. Now, we're delighted to have what, uh, what uh, J. Juline left for us. It's like, it seems to me that, that his, his work was kind of uh, built parallel to the other two photographers I mentioned. But certainly, Norman, Norman Edson went on to other things and eventually wound up um, being a, uh, a favorite son of Vashon Island, but J. Juline was sort of uh, belonged to Everett for the, uh, for the rest of his life. Among Juline's uh, uh, specialties, especially around 1912, 1913, 1914, were circuit panorama photographs that I can't really show you on this projection machine, but you'll find them right here in the uh, Hippo Culture Center. Uh, basically a, a, a format that allowed a, a, a mechanically driven camera to scan uh, uh, around a, a radius and photograph 180 degrees worth of, uh, of imagery and say four and a half, five inches wide and sometimes four feet long. Uh, he did that on a number of occasions at gatherings at the tribal uh, uh, longhouse and uh, he used it in downtown Everett as well to photograph uh, motorcycle clubs and parade gatherings and all sorts of different things. He also engaged in, in some uh, motion picture photography, uh, probably some here on the res that we don't know about and we've never actually had any success trying to trace any of Julene's motion picture activities. But uh, at the present time, uh, uh, his, uh, his work is largely displayed on the Everett Public Library's website. The, uh, the EPLS.org site has an entire section under digital collections, so you can go in there and look at your leisure at the pictures that he took, uh, not simply of Tulalip, but of, uh, of Everett and Snohomish County. Uh, the series that he did of uh, automobiles in various picturesque locations around Snohomish County in the late 20s and early 30s is worth uh, a special exhibit of its own that I think will probably be mounting sometime in the not too distant future because uh, Julene did that for the weekend automobile supplement for the Everett Herald for many years and uh, it provides not only an, an opportunity to look at uh, some very interesting old automobiles but also to look at settings all over the place that show you the way Snohomish County used to, used to be. From time to time he'd bring those automobiles out here to the res and photograph them in front of uh, familiar uh, scenery with Native Americans in place. So to wrap up, the Everett also produced uh, uh, a, a remarkable pair of sisters uh, uh, whose business, uh, the Rigby Sisters Photo Studio, uh, left some memorable Native American photography not connected really directly with Tulalip. Pilchuck Julia, of course, lived a little bit north of Snohomish and uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, the most memorable photographs of Julia, including the photograph uh, that you see here, which was issued in large numbers as a, as a postcard, uh, uh, she, she, was a, she was a very popular figure in the early days, was the one who predicted the big snow of 1916. And this, this Rigby sister's photograph of her in her fur outfit uh, was the one that was, that was used with her obituary in 1923 when she died. And a very powerful piece of portraiture that shows, uh, uh, tells us a lot about the character of the lady that, uh, that uh, was so well known and so well loved in Snohomish back in the early days of the century. And of course, when we got to discussing Curtis earlier on um, uh, this month, we uh, found that in many cases, what we saw in terms of his values of trying to preserve a culture uh, were not really the main goal of the photographers here in Everett and Snohomish County. They 
frequently seem to have become more directly engaged with the personalities, with the character of the human beings that they were taking pictures of, and that the culture itself uh, was, was peripheral, in some cases um, uh, even uh, uh, bruised up around the edges. And what you really saw were the people that these photographers wound up kind of bonding with and leaving a record of that uh, were just uh, uh, remarkable and memorable pictures uh, from uh, photo studios that most people have uh, absolutely forgotten about. So rather than let, have you forget about, uh, about uh, those three guys, I thought I would take a little bit of time this evening to tell you about Norman Stewart Edson, um, who died from a flu shot back in the 1960s, and, uh, and uh, a fellow uh, uh, who uh, may or may not have been related to the Matthew Brady who took pictures of the American Civil War, but Ferdinand Brady was a Marysville photographer, an Everett photographer, and, a, and uh, a, a, a Anacortes photographer who uh, gave us wonderful images of the Reds. And also J. Julene. And uh, certainly with Edson and J. Julene, I can say that they're preserved in the, uh, in the archives of the, uh, of the Everett Public Library with uh, all the care and all the affection we can, uh, we can bestow upon them. And that we uh, intend to look for other ways to make their material uh, uh, available to the public. And we can all look into those faces that they uh, so carefully photographed all those many, many years ago. I want to thank you all for, for coming this evening. I want to leave enough time for you to, uh, to ask questions or, or make comments. Yes. But you lay out uh, pictures. How did they? How they commercialize? Were they were they commissioned by the by the crime or were they? Almost always, the main way was to was to do postcards from them. Uh, uh, picture postcards were the were the virtually three quarters of what I showed you uh, on the screen tonight is, was issued at one time or another as a as a postcard. Well, well, Northwest or Everett or uh, greater area. Well, mainly in the Pacific Northwest, but then of course that means they get mailed. To other places. Every once in a while, we'll get an inquiry from the East Coast or somewhere. Uh, not simply Native American photographs, but but uh, sometimes things that people can't quite figure out, like the bicycle tree and stuff like that. So those, a lot of those images got spread all over the place because people mailed them to friends and relatives elsewhere. Yeah. How do you know all this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, well, I, I know it because I absorb it because I love it. And so I've spent a lot of years thinking about it and looking at it. And, uh, and uh, yeah, yeah. I think, I think about it a lot. That's what it is. <laughs> I think that's the main reason. That was good. Yeah. Did they sign your work, Edson and Jolene? When uh, Julene, all of them did when they, things were issued commercially. A lot of the things we have, like for instance, all of the Edson stuff virtually that we were looking at tonight, uh, is, is restrikes from negatives that don't have any indication of who did it on, on them. Uh, although when those things were issued as postcards or as images in publications, then they would, they would almost always have some kind of acknowledgement as to who the photographer was. Yeah. Yeah. You, you talked about the pains they took in composing shots, uh, but, but you still feel that uh, details are accurate, that they weren't uh, creating something that wasn't actually there. Yeah, I think that's what the interesting thing to look at. Now, part of it, especially with, with Edson, it's interesting because, uh, I don't know, I, I'm always intrigued with arguments that that kind of aesthetic judgment is actually genetic. You know, in a case where his father was a, was a landscape painter, you think that maybe it's just in his blood. But then he was, he was officially trained. And I, I, he, he was, was not, what he, the only thing he could mani manipulate essentially was his, was his point of view. Is in most of those cases, there wasn't much opportunity. Technically, you could use flash powder in those darkened situations, but if you look carefully, it doesn't appear that they ever tried to, to do that. And, and in the other case, it's just a matter of picking your angle and deciding how you want the shot to compose by moving your camera from one place to another. Especially those cases with Edson where he used uh, trapezoidal shapes 
and diagonal images. You see, it seems to me that he did a remarkable job of that. A lot of photographers have tried to stay clear of that, because that, that, that tends to present aesthetic problems, and when you look at his attempts to use it, it almost never does. He almost always brings that off. But then, of course, what we're also looking at is a fragment of what he really did. Even with the short time that, that Edson was here, I'm sure he left a much larger body of work than what we've seen, because we get little glimpses occasionally of a postcard we've never seen or things like that. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of the stuff that wound up over at Burton uh, and never came back out, uh, uh, that's, that's uh, sad. We don't really know what a lot of, a lot of the other things look like. But, uh, but it just has a lot to do with the eye. You know, it's a, a lot of the photography is already is in the photographer's head. Is that he brings to bear those things that he that uh, in some cases it's not even. I, I don't think it's even a conscious process. As a matter of fact, I think when it works best, it's maybe not. He knows exactly what he wants, and he knows when it when it when it clicks. That's 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 what he goes for. At least that's the impression you have to look at it. But then that's art, right? Is to make it look like it's not like it's not difficult to make it look like it's a natural thing. When maybe sometimes it really, really wasn't. Hey, thank you all for coming. And I, I really encourage all of you, I, just, I know you, so I know a lot of you already are, to support Hibbald, support, support what's going on here. This is, this is, this is for the tribes and, and about them. But it is really a wonderful thing for all of us to have this available and to have this place and to have this dedication to the story of the culture that tells us the story of this place. Uh, if you're not already members, uh, you know, uh, uh, do it and, and come up often. Uh, it, it has things to tell you that, you, that you're gonna need a number of visits to be able to really truly absorb. If, if you want, also of course, if you want affirmations of family values, I think you, you'll find that that's what, that's one of the most root sorts of uh, values about uh, what Shelton was talking about, about well, what at, at its best, uh, Tulalip culture is about is these guys that took these pictures, you know. Uh, in some cases, money crossed crossed palms, but the fact of the matter is that I think they always felt that they were graciously drawn into that culture and allowed to record it. And uh, and I think it shows. I think what you're seeing there is the generosity and the grace of a people who did a pretty remarkable job of inhabiting this place for uh, a long, long time before uh, Vancouver cruised into the into the uh, uh, neighborhood and uh, uh, property values took off. <laughs> hey, thank you all for coming.